This song is called Another Chance for those of us who need another chance at love. If I get another chance at love, if I get another chance, I will call you my sweet If I get another chance at love, if I get another chance, I'll hold you like I'm never leaving you. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. oh.
on drums. Thank you all so much. Shara, thank you again so much for, for playing those songs for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Um, let's dig in. Um, I wanted to talk first and foremost about your new album, A Million and One. Can you just maybe give us a high-level overview of it, where it came from, and um, kind of what went into to making this music? I've lived in Detroit for 10 years, <laughs> and yeah, and um, as a teenager, I lived in Ypsilanti, and so I got Detroit radio, and so um, I had moved, I'd li lived in nine states by the time I was 18 years old, but Michigan was where I was a teenager, and so the music from Detroit really deeply impacted my life, and I was thinking a lot about my response to the city and the impact that it's had on my life. And also at the same time being an outsider, even though I have a relationship to the city, it also feels like um, I've always, my family is very migrant. And um, so I wanted to just like reflect on the music of the city. And so A Million Own One is very, very much tied to the music of Detroit. And you wrote it and recorded uh, a good portion of it here in Detroit. Um, other than the inspiration that you kind of talk about in the past of uh, some of the previous musicians and music that came from Detroit, recording it and writing it here in the city, did you feel a certain vibe from the city that kind of went into what the album ultimately sounds like? For sure, for sure, for sure. Um, in terms of the sonic landscape, um, certainly Motown 
um, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder. I saw Stevie at Joe Louis Arena yeah. um, in 2015, I think it was. And certainly his impact is, is enormous um, for all of us. And Carl Craig, Techno, of course. Um, Patti Smith, and Iggy Pop, The White Stripes. So all of those, all of those artists were, were influencing the work. You uh, one one of the songs on the album, um, "Rising Star," actually starts with a really cool lead-in from Smokey Robinson. Um, it's from his uh, iconic song uh, "Mickey's Monkey." Is that that's all part of the process, right? Why did you choose Smokey out of all the great ones, right? Okay, so yeah. so it's not actually Smokey though, yeah. because ah, all the rights game, right? The rights game. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but it's actually Saul Williams is doing the sample. Beautiful. Um, but it is it is It's a inspired. replication. Yeah. Inspired by inspired that's by fair, Smokey. right? We can do yeah. that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> but so, it was it was like also a reaction to Seven Nation Army because of course you can't go anywhere in the world without hearing that riff. And I um and so I was thinking a lot about the Red Wings and like, man, how do I how do I write a song, you know, for the Red Wings, for for a loop for everybody to sing along to? So Rising Star kind of started with that inspiration. And you're in Hockey Town, so what better place to start yeah. with that, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you, you mentioned a little bit, I feel, um, but the, the actual title of the album, A Million and One, um, you talked a little bit about the inspiration, but talk about where, where kind of the title comes from and what that means to you as well. I think you can't live in a city like Detroit and not think about your relationship to this place. Um, and so the the album is, is an investigation, a questioning of our relationship first to ourselves and then to our neighbors and then in the global community. So as we become more individuated as a single person, more articulate in who we are as a, as a single person, um, that's part of the spiritual path. And then on the, on the other side of the spiritual path, or maybe it's the same side, is, is how do we relate with the world? Yeah, TBD, I guess, and, right? The, the million and <laughs> That's one. a good question. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, that, that kind of brings everything together. And, and I like, I, I read in uh, Rolling Stone um, this quote that you, that I want to read. So it says, the album examines the quest for my individuality and the search for a deeper relationship to my body, my neighbors, and the planet. So like you said, that covers a lot, right? From individual, kind of all the way up to planetary. Like, how do you, how do you bring all of that into one album? I, I, or, or is this an attempt and, and there's more to come yet? I guess you can't really tackle all of that in in a single song. Right. So it's more like um, using songs as as stories and as pieces of the larger question. You're a classically trained vocalist, and uh, I believe you self-taught yourself a lot of instrumentation as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your your musical background and kind of where your passion for music started and how it's developed to some of the music we're hearing today? My family um, are all musical, and my father was a um, a choir evangelist. A choir, uh, sorry, my father was a, a choir director. Mm-hmm in a Pentecostal church. And my grandfather was an evangelist who traveled all over the country and he was a guitar player and they had the family band and, um, and traveled the United States for 50 or 60 years. Um, they would go to a different city and do a revival for one week and then go to the next town. And they did that their whole lives. Um, and so, everybody in the family plays. Um, so that was just normal behavior. Um, but then at my high school in Ypsilanti, there was an incredible choral program. And so my training really started there. And then I went to university for opera and then have self-taught um, through life, um, uh, composing for marching bands and for symphonies now. Yeah. And you've used marching bands and symphonies and choirs and lots of different things in your music. Um, I, I think what's so interesting in listening, so this is your fifth album. Um, 
and you've done some EPs and some remix albums. So there's a lot more than just five albums. Um, some of your songs and, and some of your albums in total have uh, a, like a dreamlike feel to them. Some of your songs are more like dance floor songs where there's some pop aspects to them. Uh, so you bring a lot of these different inspirations into your music. Like, w does each song, when you're composing a song, when you're kind of thinking of the song, does it start off, do you know kind of where the song's going? Do you start with a lyric and it turns into more of a dreamlike song, more of an alt song, or does it turn into a pop song as you're, you're developing? Or do you know when you start out, this is what I'm trying to compose? I know it's a very deep question. Sorry, I <laughs> covered a lot, but I'm always curious about the kind of the creative prospect behind uh, creating an album or creating a sound. Um, as a as a composer, because I have a very eclectic taste, I start with um, almost a set of guidelines or a rule set where um, for the first record it was going to be rock band and strings. And the second one was going to be um, instruments that were earth and sky. So wood, uh, bass clarinet, marimba, uh, bassoons, and harp strings, some horns too. And then um, I got very frustrated with uh, working with the acoustic challenges of asking violins to play loud and drummers to play quietly. And so the third record was an investigation of acoustic music. So it's more, it's much more classical. Sure. Um, excuse me. And then, then I thought, well, what's the loudest thing that I could possibly do? And so the fourth record was really about marching bands and, and trying to move into three-dimensional space. And then on this record, I thought, okay, I have, I've made a big, big splash and big noise. How do I really, really focus on song structure? Mm -hmm. So the maximum I'm allowing myself to... Um, use for orchestration is just like one maybe two keyboards maybe a bass if I am very indulgent and and vocals so there's it's very little guitar so the, I tried to kind of keep it to four elements and no more absolutely and and I, I love that uh, you you put the words in my mouth but you're not afraid to kind of push yourself from a sonic perspective, your music, you've tried lots of different things and I think it's all worked out very well in different ways. Um, you, you're very thoughtful in your song composition as well. You're talking about uh, some simplicity in songs on this album, but uh, you've got a song called This Is My Hand that has over 160 individual tracks on it. How do you put something like that together? I, I have a hard time sitting down and strumming a guitar. I love music, but uh, composition-wise, I, I, it completely escapes me. How do you put something like that together from start to finish? And then maybe secondarily, how do you recreate that when you're playing live or, or do you even, or is that something you just keep within the studio? I think that was also part of, uh, I'm very impressed with your research, by the way. That's really, I didn't even Thank remember you. there were that many tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that's, that's a high compliment. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I think because... Ma ma maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's only like 30 and I completely made that up. So you have to fact check <laughs> no, me afterwards. Please send me an email. Let me know about that. Okay, good. There were multiple Pro Tools sessions that we had good. to merge. Okay. Cool. So All right. <laughs> it, it was quite a beast. All right. Um, I think because of that, the, the records are the dream, right? But then live, sometimes you're, you're in a, a totally different situation and, and you fingers crossed that the song still lives. Um, so um, how do we pull it off? It, some of the songs can't be reduced. Um, this Is My Hand is really hard sure. to bring that one down. Do, but you, do you ever play that live or not necessarily? With orchestra. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe coming up soon, we'll see. We yeah. do have a trio yeah. version with Chris Bruce on guitar, and, and he reinvented the, the accompaniment, which sure. is really fun. Yeah but I can't play that guitar part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love too just watching you play here in our office, um, just all of the, the different equipment that you use as well. It's not just a guitar and percussion. You guys are using a lot of tracks as well to, to try and recreate some of that, which I think is really impressive as well. Um, you, you talked about this a little bit too, and, and again, I, I love the creative process but behind where music comes from. You know, some songs are written in five minutes. Some songs are written over the course of years, right? You hear legendary stories of Bob Dylan writing a story piece by piece over four or five years. Um, for you, how does that process work? How do you determine, you know, which 
cuts of a song or which songs even make it to an album ultimately is is it a feel that you have is it a vibe that you get as you kind of start positioning the songs together and you say this one actually doesn't fit i'll save it for the next album or i'll scratch it all together what what's that process like for you all the other records i was sometimes writing a song a day um and so you might have 15 songs that you can pick which ones make the best uh, configuration for a 10 or 11 song record. But this album, I had a very great luxury. I was awarded a United Artist grant and that afforded me time for the very first time in my life (laughs) um, to be able to write over 50 songs. And um, so showing up to the desk every day, as my job like I love that Leonard Cohen says that he would put on his suit and go to work and I treat songwriting with the same respect Um, it's my job I love it it's fun it's my greatest delight Um, but it's also like a discipline Um, so some of the songs like another chance you get them in five minutes and then uh, champagne also came quite quickly, but Rising Star is a complicated time signature. It's very, very difficult to set the text over this odd meter. Um, it's me on the dance floor. I think I rewrote at least seven times. So some of them are really like you're wrestling with that thing, and yeah. and you hope that it's worth the fight. Does it just click for you, like uh, like dance floor? Does it? You you you're in your seventh iteration. You're like, I got it. This is it. This is the right song, and and it goes to the album. Or do you struggle? Do you still wrestle with it even when you get to that seventh iteration? I really trust my collaborators a lot. And the drummer who wrote that drum beat, um, I had rewritten it and he said to me, Shara, you know, dance floor number (laughs) 07.3.2. He like really went back. He was like, that's where you had like the core of the song. And so I needed that feedback um, from him, certainly. And how do you, sorry, uh, uh, one, two, three, this, wait, maybe 11 or 12 songs on this. So you said you wrote 50 songs. Like as an artist, is it difficult to say, okay, I've written 50 songs that I love or like or somewhere in between? Where does the process go where you say, okay, here's 50, I need 12 to fit on an album? How do you pare that down? What's the narrative? What's the story? What's the what's the feeling that you are you want to express? And putting one tune can tilt the meaning of the entire record. So um, we had two songs, Dorian and Quiet Loud, which both songs I really like those songs. But if I put them on, the focus of the record shifted. So it was really about the whole of what I wanted to communicate and what feelings and moods I wanted to hit. So I went for more contrast. Sure. Yeah. And you can save some of those songs. You've, you've got 30 some songs that didn't make this album and and you could save them for another album. But again, your, your sound and style has changed over different records. So those might not even make the cutting for the next album, right? For sure. Yeah. It's a lot of work, right? (laughs) Yeah. A lot of behind the scenes work that goes on. Um, so thank you for sharing around the creative side of things. That's always so interesting for us. Um, kind of speaking a little bit more about the creative process. So you're currently on tour, uh, right now promoting the record, but you're also working on, uh, I guess a couple of larger scale projects. We had talked about this a little bit in advance. Um, one in Cincinnati, uh, and one here in Detroit. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe stepping outside of, uh, the record in my brightest diamond, talk about some of the other creative things that you're working on as well and how that all kind of fits together for you. The Cincinnati symphony reached out to me and said, we want to do a community project. And if you could do one with us, what would you do? And I made a proposal to them and said, I'd love to work with, I, d- I did a Google search. Thank you. And, um, and, and became aware of how many incredible choirs and incredible um, instrumentalists and dancers are in Cincinnati. So we began to make a list. And we are going to make a, a piece with over 30 different groups of looking at who is around us. And I was inspired by a poem by Siri Imani called Lost Generation. 
And in the poem, she begins, I need you to care, not about yourself or obtaining your wealth. I need you to look around. And so I took that um, and called her up (laughs) and said, hey, Siri, I got an idea. idea. Um, How do you feel about doing that poem with the Cincinnati Symphony? And so we called the piece Look Around. And um, so that'll be on August 3rd. And basically what I... Uh, what we did was reached out to the groups and did an interview process. So over the course of six months, um, doing interviews, what do you care about? Who are you? How do you identify yourself? What are you passionate about? What are you mad about? What is your relationship to Washington Park? And, And the amount of things that poured out of people, um, I was able to then write songs for these choirs and reflect back to them their own words. It's, it's interesting. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we ta- we started off talking about My Brightest Diamond, A Million and One, going from individual to community to planetary, I think I used the word. Um, this next project feels like more community, right? So is this kind of a natural progression? So your music as My Brightest Diamond and now this project in Cincinnati is more trying to bring that community feel into things. What kind of world do we want to be in one? In What kind of world do we want to be in? And how do we see our neighbors? How do we share space with one another? How do we listen to somebody that we might pass on the street and and not engage with at all and so I think look around is is trying to disrupt that normal pattern of I do my thing I go on my way sure um and so we're creating a, a different kind of space for people to engage with each other absolutely and maybe more important so now than ever right where mm. people are head down and their phones and their technology and not necessarily interacting with folks and, and what, what what better way to bring people together through music and art as well um coming back to detroit then um i believe you're working on a project as well here in the city for 2020 um can you tell us a little bit about that if, if you're able to kind of give us a little bit of a peek into that as well yeah um we received a night grant for this this project Congrats. which i'm thrilled yeah. about um the project is called body vessel and it's a collaboration with my dear friend helga davis sure. um, helga for those of you in town she was in einstein on the beach um for those who caught her uh performance at university of michigan um and helga and i helga is a black new yorker and she and I speak about race a lot. And we thought, what if we could take our conversation that we have listening to one another, hearing each other, engaging with our world from really different places, how do we take that conversation and bring it to the fore with other people. So um, Body Vessel is an investigation of our friendship, of um, experiences as a white person, as a black person, as a a blended person. Um, So we're working with Annika Kukpitelli, who is making a dress for two. So she, uh, Helga and I are gonna be in a dress, um, staring each other down. <laughs> <laughs> what better way to get closer, right? Yeah. 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 And, and what better backdrop for things that you talked about than the city of Detroit as well, as well with lots of different things happening, right? With uh, the growth of the city and gentrification and things like that. All of us in Detroit are, are feeling our way as well, right? And it seems like this is a bit of a commentary on the things that a lot of us are feeling, right? Yeah, we have to find a way to talk about race. It's one of the most complex social uh, challenges that we have. And so so if we don't uh, talk about it, we get so scared. I get so scared just saying the word. <laughs> right. So if that alone can bring even, um, even me personally like that much uh, anxiety, then it's worth braving um the the conversation with playing music and writing music and composing and 
touring Cincinnati, Detroit, I would feel guilty keeping you any longer. Uh, it sounds like you need to get back on to this entire creative process. So best of luck with all of those projects. We, we can't thank you enough for stopping in uh, to play a little bit of music for us today and to chat with us. This is very inspiring. Um, thank you so much, Shara. Thank you as well uh, for all of you who joined us. And uh, maybe let's end with one more round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.